Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. Um, so I'm sorry I can't be there for the first day of classes. Unfortunately, I'm uh, at a conference and I need to be here until uh, Monday. And so I'm going to be missing your class tomorrow. Uh, but I didn't want you to uh, lose uh, any material in the time that I'm gone. So here I am making this uh, video. I'm actually in Scotland and I'm going to, I'm in St. Andrews and I'll be here uh, until uh, Monday, yeah. Uh, okay, so actually let me just start by also saying, you know, that I'll unfortunately be missing two more classes this semester, also for conferences. Uh, next Thursday will be off. Uh, well, at least it's not going to be off for you, but I'm not going to be around because I'm going to be in Greece for another conference. And then on November 21st, I'm going to be in Spain for yet another conference. Um, nevertheless, I'll make up for each of these uh, conferences, uh, sorry, for each of these missed sessions um, uh, by uh, either video or if you guys have an assignment, then you'll just do the assignment at that time. Okay. So what I'm going to do, because I have three classes that I'm teaching this semester, is that I'm going to start with the general part, which is shared between all the classes, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about each specific part. Um, so, my name is Rami Lali, and I'm going to be your teacher for this semester. Um, honestly, I'm unsure, you know, who's going to be in the class, so maybe some of you know me, maybe some of you don't, but in any case, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the course is going to be run. So, first of all, um, you have on Blackboard uh, the course packets, which are electronic course packets, and um, you can feel free to use them on your computer or your iPads or uh, print them out. Um, it's up to you, but you have to make sure that you do read because uh, in this course, uh, reading is not uh, optional. Um, you can see my email, you can see my web page there, you can see my office, and also um, you can see where my office hours are. So because I'm working on a book this semester, I'm not going to be around in my office all the time. And so if you'd like to meet with me, just make sure that you email me one day in advance. If you do, I'll always be there. And the days that I will be able to meet are Tuesday and Thursday, uh, 11 to 12, 15, and Wednesday, 11 onwards uh, for the rest of the day. So at any time uh, during those times you can email me one day ahead of time and I'll be sure to show up uh, okay so uh, let me start by saying a few things um, unfortunately I left my iPad so I have to look at this uh, on my phone um, okay so uh, I guess LAU now has this new procedure where we have to tell you guys what sort of teaching or learning method these classes use so uh, all the classes in philosophy use what we call the Socratic method. This is like a method method where I ask you guys questions and I have you answer them. Uh, I guess you'll see it, you know, in practice. Uh, so I'm not going to sit down and describe it very much. But the important thing for you to realize is that all uh, philosophy courses focus on critical thinking and they uh, assume your involvement. So if you're not ready to be involved and if you're not ready to uh, think about uh, these issues instead of just memorize, uh, or, you know, um, something else, then uh, please just drop the course, you know, it's uh, not going to be a course for you. Um, the idea is to have you guys uh, be able to form uh, your own judgment skills, you know, uh, that's what critical thinking uh, really means. Um, okay, so um, you have to read the syllabus if it's your responsibility. Everything in the syllabus is your responsibility, so please don't, uh, you know, assume that uh, this uh, short lecture uh, is going to be a replacement for that. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to highlight some of the important parts. Uh, so now I'm going to be looking at the academic violations and the code of conduct that you guys are expected to follow. Uh, so the most important ones for me is that if you receive, purchase, or sell a project, a paper, or any academic uh, document, document uh, and present it as your own or have somebody else present it as your own, the punishment for that is suspension or expulsion from the university as a whole. So make sure that you don't do this. I'm very strict about these things. I've uh, punished students before for this type of thing. So make sure that you don't do this. Uh, 
You can't submit the same paper you've submitted to another class unless you ask me in advance. That's another important one. Um, if you copy the words of another person, this is plagiarism, okay? If you copy the words of another person, whether those words are in writing, from a YouTube video, from an audio recording, my own words, uh, without saying that this is the source that you're using, this counts as plagiarism, and you'll definitely get a zero on the assignment, and if this happens again, you'll get an F on the course as a whole. Um, and finally, of course, you can't use copyrighted material. This is uh, roughly the same thing, you know, uh, at least uh, in my book for as far as plagiarism goes. Um, you also can't record these lectures uh, for your personal use unless you ask me in advance. You have to take uh, permission from me. Uh, so make sure that you do that. If you're caught doing that without permission, um, this also uh, gets you a warning, a dean's warning, um, and then a double dean's warning. Um, OK. Um, so let me just tell you now about the uh, attendance policy. Um, you're expected to attend all the classes, okay? Um, for valid reasons, you can miss uh, classes for up to a maximum of the equivalent of two regular weeks. This means you can miss a maximum of four classes. If you miss more than four classes, then I um, need you to drop the course. I'm telling you this right now. So if you don't drop the course, you will most definitely receive an F. If you miss more than four classes, since these are only Tuesday, Thursday classes, uh, you will most definitely get an F in the course or else you have to drop, okay? Um, if you have some sort of, you know, problem uh, like illness or something happens, uh, you have to talk to the department chair. This is uh, Professor uh, Vahid Behmerdi uh, uh, about your situation. You don't talk to me about it. Um, okay. Um, and uh, you're responsible for all the material uh, that you miss in any classes. Uh, regardless of what the reason is, so I'm not going to be repeating the material uh, because you weren't uh, around. Um, for withdrawal from the course, right, you can receive three sorts of, uh, you know, withdrawals from the course. One is an early withdrawal. This doesn't count towards anything in your transcript, and you have to do this within the first five weeks of the class. Uh, then there's a WP, which means withdrawal but in good standing, and then there's withdrawal uh, WF, which is with withdrawal in bad standing. Uh, the latter gives you uh uh, uh, impacts uh, your uh, transcript negatively, the other uh, does not. Uh, okay, so LAU has a new policy now, and this new policy is that if you complete your instructor evaluation at the end, the end course evaluation at the end of the semester, you can get your grades faster. And I just want to point out, because I think some students don't seem to know this, uh, that I'm the one who receives your course evaluations. So you're not, you know, uh, writing to somebody else and telling them, oh, look, Look, this class was this way or that way, you're writing to me, so leave feedback that would help me improve the course in the future. This is what really matters. Um, and, uh, you know, to do this, you have to explain why you're giving the evaluation that you're giving. You know, don't say, oh, the course was awesome, because that doesn't, you know, tell us anything. And don't say the course was terrible, because that doesn't tell us anything. Say it was terrible because blah, blah, blah. And it was awesome because blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, uh, so that we can improve the university as a whole and to improve the situation of future uh, students who are taking the course. Let me give you some tips for success in my courses. Um, so these are also written in your syllabus. Um, don't waste your time uh, thinking and talking about grades. Don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. Uh, this class is about the topics we're covering, not about the grades. Uh, you know, this is like somebody playing Pac-Man and looking at the high score the whole time that they're playing Pac-Man. Uh, you're going to lose that way. The best way to win is to pay attention to Pac-Man, make sure you eat all the dots, and this is how you're going to get a high score. So if you pay attention to the course material, you will most definitely definitely be able to do well in the class. Uh, look, uh, reading is not optional in this class. I'm going to, in some cases, quiz you on these. I'm going to, you know, make sure that when you answer questions, that your answers and questions are uh, informed by the readings. Um, if I feel uh, like, uh, you know, you're uh, uh, not uh, doing the readings, then I'm going to uh, figure out some procedure of uh, making you do them. It's not that you have to do them, you know, 100% of the time, but at least aim for 80% of the time, not for 20% of the time. And honestly, uh, the only students who benefit from classes are the ones who do the readings. And you might think that university is 
just a temporary thing, but it's not, you know, uh, this is you're investing in your own mind in the same way that you can invest, uh, you know, in uh, a career, uh, you can invest in your own mind, you can invest in your own body and so on. Um, okay, uh, definitely, as, as I said, again, don't miss the four classes. Um, and look, uh, using a phone, a laptop, etc., is going to distract you and distract others around you. Now, I don't care if you don't care about your own distraction, but I do care that you don't distract anybody around you. So make sure you avoid this as much as possible. If you're going to be using a laptop or an iPad or a phone uh, for the readings, uh, then that's fine. But then don't you know jump to Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is uh, uh, on the side. If you do that, I uh, will definitely deduct uh, points uh, from uh, your total. Um, let me give you a final additional remark because I've had some uh, very unpleasant encounters uh, in the last semester. Um, look, I will not accept any requests to not fail you if you deserve to fail. If you deserve to fail, you will fail. I don't care if this will mean that you lose your scholarship, that you have to leave the university, that you have to leave your program, that you have to lose a job, that you have to get into extensive trouble with your family. None of these reasons matter. If you want to pass the course, then work hard uh, to do well in the course and make sure that you avoid cheating and plagiarism at all costs. If you're unclear about what any of this means, it's your responsibility to ask me, um, okay? Um, so I think this uh, does it with the uh, general part and now you know we can uh, move on to uh, some of the more fun and pleasant parts about uh, the course. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, so let me tell you now a little bit about uh, existentialism. Uh, actually, this is a really wonderful class. Uh, existentialism is a philosophical movement uh, that uh, begins in the first half of the 20th century. This means like 1900s to about 19. 50s, it's actually a little bit later than that, up to maybe 1970s. Uh, it's a wonderful movement because actually it's, uh, unlike many other philosophical movements, it aimed to do, uh, instead of becoming more and more abstract, it became more and more concrete. And um, this is because the goal of this movement was actually to describe everyday human experience. You guys are alive every day and you experience your world every day. And what the existentialists really wanted to do is to kind of get us to an understanding of how it is that we live our life. So in my experience, students genuinely love this class. Uh, all my classes, all the times I've taught this class in LAU, the students have loved it. Um, and it, I, for me, uh, um, even when I took it, you know, but also for my students, I think that it makes a genuine difference to your lives and the way that you live your lives. So there's something very beautiful about this class. It's a, it's a very liberating class. And of course, probably you guys have heard things like existential crisis, a term which comes from the existentialist movement, although it doesn't really mean what it means in the existentialist movement um, and also it's a it's a class that uh, uh, you know has has a real liberating impact on individuals it can really change the way you think about yourself and the way you conceive of yourself and you can see that it's done this because so much art architecture uh, you name it has been affected by existentialism uh, so okay I'm gonna go through uh, basically five different components. I'm gonna dis uh, go just read out the course description. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about the outcomes of this class. Then I'm talking a little bit about the readings. Then I'm gonna tell you how the class is graded. And finally, just tell you how this is related to you know philosophy as a whole. Uh, okay. So this course introduces the 20th century existentialist movement while developing its connection to phenomenology. Um, so actually what you're going to learn very soon is that uh, existentialism is not its own thing. Uh, there's, it's actually called existential phenomenology and even existential phenomenology doesn't begin with existential phenomenology. It begins with something called transcendental phenomenology, which doesn't even begin there. It begins with Descartes' meditations about 300 years earlier. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, so, it's um, uh, this course begins with the early phenomenologists like Edmund Husserl or the early existentialists like Soren Kierkegaard. In fact, for us, we're going to be focusing on Edmund Husserl, not Soren Kierkegaard. And then it traces a line of development that proceeds through thinkers like Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, so Martin Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, 
uh, Hannah Arendt uh, for our class, and Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, these are all the major figures of the existentialist movement. And, you know, existentialism is a movement that uh, more or less uh, is centered in Germany and France, and these are the figures that we're going to be focusing on. Although, like I said, it had a very international impact. You can see uh, Arab existentialists. Uh, there are even some existentialist professors uh, at LAU uh, who write uh, in Arabic. Um, and now the focus of this course is going to be on the nature of consciousness, freedom, uh, being, uh, and their connection to moral, political, and religious thought. Uh, in fact, you know, the way I'm going to uh, focus this class, because this movement is, as you're going to see, it's a very large movement, and it's very complex, and the readings are very complex. Um, I'm going to try to simplify it by doing, uh, uh, by simplifying it to three things. Uh, I'm going to be asking, uh, what's, how do we relate to our world? How do we relate to ourselves? And how do we relate to others? Uh, these are, so how do we experience ourselves, our world? and others. These are going to be the three core ideas in the class and we're going to just look at how the existentialists answered uh, these sorts of questions. Uh, okay, so hopefully at the end of this class uh, as a student you'll be able to understand the development and the relationship between the phenomenological and the existentialist movements. Uh, we'll also actually cover post-existentialism, what happened after existentialism, if it ended in the 60s or the 70s, what happened after that. Um, you're going to uh, be able to demonstrate a familiarity with the basic concepts of this tradition uh, as well as be able to read the original texts. And this is not an insignificant achievement because as you're going to see, these texts are uh, quite difficult. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, you'll also hopefully be able to get a better understanding of the place of humanity in the world, you know, the place of you also as an individual, as this tradition understood it, but I think this was going to have a huge impact uh, for us. I think it has a particular impact for us uh, today in Lebanon. Um, and then finally, the idea is to be able to apply these ideas of the class uh, to your personal lives and also your political or social lives and with a particular uh, application in the Middle Eastern context uh, that we live in. Okay, so... Um, this is just kind of a brief about what the class is like. Actually, let me tell you a little bit about how this relates to uh, the, uh, the program, the philosophy program as a whole. Uh, the idea is that this course, if you're a philosophy major or interested in minoring in philosophy, will help you to critically engage with contemporary philosophical ideas that have had a large, large impact uh, on the contemporary world. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say that, um, uh, you know, Europe and uh, the U.S. are are more or less built on the ideas of these existentialists and you know for us in the Arab world where we seem to be lagging behind in so many different ways I think it will benefit us to understand uh, uh, what this movement said and what impact uh, it had you're also going to uh, be able to extract arguments, uh, definitions, and ideas from these 20th, 20th century philosophical works. Um, and then finally, uh, the aim is that you'll also be able to present philosophical arguments in a clear, analytic, and persuasive manner in writing. And I just want to uh, highlight, you know, uh, don't feel like if you're not a philosophy major, uh, what do you have to do with this class? You do have something to do with this class because, you know, being able to formulate arguments in clear, analytic, and persuasive uh, writing uh, is very important regardless of what you do, you know. Uh, and of course, to understand yourself and your surroundings and how people behave, this is to your advantage regardless of what your major is. So I really want to, uh, you know, say that this class uh, has relevance for everybody, not just for uh, for uh, students interested in these types of topics. And in my own experience at LAU, uh, most students have felt this way about this class. They felt that this class has uh, genuinely contributed to the way they understood uh, themselves and others. Of course, <laughs> those who were working in the class, not those who were uh, asleep in it, those probably failed. Um, okay, so, uh, let me tell you now a little bit about this class. So actually, what we're going to do is we're roughly going to focus on uh, a few different figures. So the nice thing about this class is that you won't be reading material from all over the place. You'll only be reading from a few different characters. And although all of these guys write in a somewhat difficult style, uh, I'm going to do my best uh, uh, to help you to read them. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a, a benefit that you also get is that I'll never assign you very big readings. I think the largest reading 
readings that you'll ever get in the semester are like 10 pages. Uh, and once you know how to read these guys, just think of it as an ability that you've gained in the same way that you might learn how to ride a bike and then now forevermore you know how to ride a bike. Uh, reading these existentialists will give you the ability to understand them forevermore. You know many students get so excited about like characters like Nietzsche or uh, Sartre or Simone de Beauvoir uh, but most of them don't really understand what these guys were saying and they don't know how to read them and so they get stuck in false ideas about these characters. Uh, what this class is going to give you is it's going to give you the ability to accurately read uh, these figures and although the readings are hard I promise you that I will go and uh, through uh, every concept and every idea uh, term by term and we can proceed as slowly as we have to uh, for you to understand the stuff. But of course, you just have to keep in mind, you know, that if you don't put in, um, if you don't try, you're not going to succeed. So you got to try, okay? Uh, in a way, it's a bit like, uh, you know, maybe this is like a challenging sport, you know? Uh, it's hard to, you know, get started on it. But once you do, you know, you're going to get better and better at it. And that's going to be to your uh, benefit. Okay. So um, in the first week, uh, we're basically looking at what's existentialism, and this is roughly what I'm doing right now. Um, and then, you know, starting next week, uh, we'll uh, start by looking at the, basically the prehistory of existentialism. Like 400 years uh, before the 20th century began and before existentialism proper begins, uh, this guy, you know, René Descartes, this French thinker, uh, writes a book called The Meditations. And uh, this book ends up having a huge impact on, uh, on, the, on the way humans thought about themselves altogether. Probably many of you guys believe that you have a mind and you have a body. This is not an idea that's coming to you from religion. You know, religion tells you you have a soul. It doesn't tell you you have a mind. Where do you get the idea that a soul is a mind or roughly they're the same thing? Well, it's this guy, Descartes. Um, and in fact, you know, Descartes had an important uh, foundational role in uh, what we call science today. Before that, you know, we didn't really have a proper scientific method. He and a few other figures were some of the major contributors to our uh, development today. Uh, very often, you know, philosophy remains in the background and its effect on culture and on, on history is invisible. Uh, but it's not an exaggeration to say that when Descartes um, said what he said in the meditations, this allowed us to start thinking scientifically and in turn this allowed us to start thinking about, you know, building things like computers which now we use all the time. So although its effect is very distant, uh, it nevertheless is at the foundations of uh, what ends up uh, happening in our society and in our world today. Um, so in the second week, next week, we're going to be looking at Descartes' meditations. We're going to be only looking at a part of these meditations, meditations one through three, and we'll see what the core idea that Descartes introduces and which gets taken up by the existentialists is. Then uh, in uh, weeks, uh, uh, basically, uh, oh, I have the syllabus kind of slightly messed up. Okay, so it's, it's actually weeks three through five. So it's weeks three, four, and five. We're going to be looking at uh, the origins of existentialism. And as I said, you know, existentialism doesn't start out as existentialism. It starts out as existential phenomenology. It just gets shortened to existentialism. Well, where did existential phenomenology comes, uh, come in? And what the hell does phenomenology mean anyway? Uh, so, in fact, you know, we're going to see that existential phenomenology emerged out of something else, something called transcendental phenomenology. Uh, and uh, basically the father of all of this is this uh, uh, German, uh, you know, philosopher. He's, I don't think he's actually German himself, but I think he was writing in German, um, is Edmund Husserl, okay? Uh, you're going to see that this character was a really, really, really wonderful character. Um, uh, also a groundbreaking thinker, you know, he really managed to think past anything that had been thought uh, at his time. So in uh, week number three, we're going to be looking at uh, transcendental phenomenology and what that means. And I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but let me just put it this way. Here's what uh, Edmund Husserl wanted to do. He said, I want to describe how humans experience their reality. Uh, I want to describe it not in some abstract way. I want to describe it as you're experiencing it right now. And he set out on this project um, and, you know, in a way he failed. And this is why we had space for existential phenomenology or existentialism. And in a way, the existentialists failed because something else came after them. 
but you know, not all failures are completely useless. I mean, just think about the fact that Newtonian physics is, um, you know, it's basically false. We know that it's false because we know that the theory of relativity is true and uh, it's opposed in some of its basic assumptions to Newtonian physics. Nevertheless, we managed to get to the moon using Newtonian physics, and most of the time in our everyday world, we use Newtonian physics to do what we need to do. Um, so, um, in uh, weeks three through five, we'll look at what transcendental phenomenology means, then we'll look at human experience, how we experience our world and objects in our world, and how uh, in week uh, five, we'll look at ourselves and how we experience uh, what Husserl called uh, transcendental uh, subjectivity. Okay, uh, then uh, from there, Okay, and so uh, weeks uh, six uh, through eight, uh, you know, or six onwards, we start with existentialism proper. And you guys might think, why would we spend five weeks without, you know, even getting to existentialism? But I can, really can't underestimate, uh, I can't, you know, uh, downplay uh, to what extent the origins of existentialism matter uh, for understanding what existentialism is. And so this is why we're spending so much time uh, on that. Uh, so, so week six through eight, uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at Martin Heidegger, who is uh, basically the first what we call an existential phenomenologist. And um, uh, he was uh, Husserl's student. And um, what he does is he revolutionizes in a certain way Husserl's method. And this is what gives birth to existential phenomenology. So you'll see that in week six, we are going to be looking again at our relationship to the world, this time transformed by the way uh, that that Heidegger reinterprets it. Uh, and then week seven and week eight, we're going to be looking at uh, how we contextualize ourselves as uh, humans, as beings, um, amongst other people. After all, others play a huge part of our in our lives, right? We are, uh, on the one hand, we come from them, you know, you're born from a family. Um, and then, you know, the rest of your life is basically uh, hanging around with people and, you know, trying to uh, get to know people, disliking some people, liking some people, and so on. So week uh, seven, uh, we emphasize uh, this uh, original idea of being with others. Uh, and then in week eight, we talk about kind of some of the uh, results of uh, having a life uh, amidst others. We'll also get the chance to watch a movie in the class, and this is uh, a movie about the philosopher Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt was a Heidegger student, and as we'll see, uh, she and Heidegger had a very complicated relationship, mainly because Heidegger notoriously uh, supported the Nazis, and Hannah Arendt, you know, um, is a, a Jewish philosopher, uh, and she ends up, you know, using what Heidegger said, you know, to uh, both, uh, you know, uh, kind of address how he failed, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, emphasizing, you know, what it is to be an evil person. She's a very controversial figure. Um, you know, you can Google it if you'd like to know a little bit more, but we'll watch a movie and this will give us a nice uh, impression of how she developed uh, Heidegger's thought, but also used it in new ways that he hadn't expected. I also have to say this part is super, you know, interesting for us in the Arab world uh, today. Okay, and then, you know, uh, weeks uh, 9 through, let's see, weeks 9 through 13, uh, this is where we're really going to get to the people who turned existentialism from existential phenomenology to existentialism. Uh, and these are Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, who are probably, you know, uh, the popular, uh, you know, the, the people who most popularized existentialism and turned it into, uh, you know, what we think of today when we say things like existential crisis. Um, so, uh, on week nine, we'll introduce the core idea that occurs in existentialism for the first time very explicitly, which is this idea of freedom, and uh, the idea that freedom comes with a lot of responsibility. Um, in uh, week 10, we'll talk about the sort of threats that uh, result in us when we confront our own freedom. And this is what uh, Jean-Paul Sartre calls uh, bad faith. Um, I won't say much more about that uh, for the time being. Weeks 11, in week 11, we'll again turn to others. And this time, you know, uh, Sartre is not going to focus on others in the plural, not how you relate to society, but rather how you relate uh, to an individual uh, other person. And this is a really interesting uh, discussion. Again, very relevant for a person's individual development. Um, 
And then in weeks 12 and 13, we'll turn to Simone de Beauvoir, who uh, develops existentialism, but develops it in this new context. And she asks the question, what is a woman? And you might think, well, isn't it obvious what a woman is? Um, but in fact, from an existentialist point of view, it's not all that obvious. It's not that all that obvious what a man is either. But I think that by looking at her work, we'll be able to address both of these questions. So in week 12, we look at this question, what is a woman? And in week uh, 13, we look at this idea of women having a particular destiny and whether they in fact do. Um, okay. So by the time we've gotten here in the course, as you guys can see, the weather is really erratic in this place. Um, so uh, by the time we get uh, to uh, uh, weeks 14 and 15, we're actually going to have developed a good idea of what existentialism is and also a good idea of what its shortcomings were. And so this will move us to the final philosopher that we'll be looking at, who is Emmanuel Levinas. Um, now, Emmanuel Levinas is not really an existentialist. He actually criticizes existentialism. His whole, um, you know, he starts out being an existentialist, but because of what happens during the period of existentialism, so you guys have to think this is World War II that's happening during this period, um, uh, Levinas introduces what he calls a phenomenology of life. And there we'll also look at our relation to the world and our relation to others, but now reinterpreted as not an existential phenomenology, but a life phenomenology. And we'll see why uh, that's such a significant difference. Okay, well, that gives you guys like a brief, you know, overview of the course. Uh, I hope you're excited. I'm super excited to be teaching it. Like I said, you know, every time I've taught it at LAU, I've taught it maybe four times. Uh, the students have loved it. Um, the readings are always difficult, you know, but I assure you that uh, the explanations I'm going to give you are going to help you understand them. And actually, you'll be in a unique position because honestly, you can't get this material anywhere. You can search all of YouTube and you're not going to get any correct views of existentialism. It's a very, very hard philosophy to interpret. Um, and you know, you kind of need a professor to teach it to. I was taught it myself by a really great professor. Um, so, you know, I hope uh, that uh, uh, this will uh, all excite you, you know, about this course. So, um, you know, because also of the difficulty of the readings, let me just tell you a little bit about how I'm going to grade the course. Basically, uh, the whole course is going to involve uh, uh, long answer questions and you're going to have uh, four sets of these. Um, uh, each time I'll give you probably the questions on Thursday or Friday and then they'll be due on Sunday evening or maybe Monday. Um, and so we'll do two sets of questions after we finish Descartes and Husserl. We'll do another two set of questions after we do Heidegger and uh, Hannah Arendt. We'll do a third set of questions with Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. And then uh, one last set of questions when we look at uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Um, also, I'm going to, because, you know, I do want you guys to practice, you know, reading these texts. It's, it's very easy to, you know, give up because they can be so daunting at the beginning. Um, so I'll give you occasional reading quizzes and, you know, mostly participation uh, grading. And so that's going to be the last 10%. So 90% is on the other assignments and then 10% is uh, uh, on attendance and participation. Well, I think this about wraps it up for, uh, you know, this introductory session and I'll uh, see you guys, um, I guess, next Tuesday. Yes, I believe so. All right. Cheers.